Welcome to Purdue University College of Science Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to the science classroom and interviewing scientists. Because as we know, scientists are the superheroes behind the science. So join us as we learn about the scientists and explore current trends in K-12 science education. Today we have Daryl Granger here in the Superheroes of Science that we're going to talk to. Daryl, uh, start off, I mean, you're kind of famous in my world, and so I know you've done National Geographic movies. Yep, I've done wow. a couple of National Geographic expeditions working in caves uh, in China and Vietnam, so were great opportunities to go travel the world and see some of the biggest caves in the world. Now, how do you, how do you get someone like Nat Geo to pay to, or to pay for an expedition for you to go do well, research? For me, honestly, it was a cold call. <laughs> oh, I, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I've been working in caves for 20, 25 years at this point. So my specialty is dating cave deposits and, and other deposits. And so I'm known in the caving community as somebody, as a scientist who can come in and look at a cave and figure out how long ago it formed. And so on these expeditions where they were studying the big caves, what they're interested in is how does this tie into the geologic history um, and how did these caves form? So I got called as a, as a scientist. Um, other scientists referred me to them. So how did you get into dating caves? So that started back in my PhD. So I work with um, what are called cosmogenic nuclides. It's a fancy word, but all it is is um, they're radioactive particles. They're produced inside rocks hmm. by cosmic rays. They come in from space and they're hitting the earth all the time. They cause nuclear reactions um, inside those grains and we can use that to date the rocks. These cosmic rays this is exactly what you have to worry about in space travel because uh, astronauts are exposed to radiation in space. They're very worried about it. For example, for the Mars expeditions, how do you shield humans from these cosmic rays? We're shielded by the Earth's magnetic field and by the Earth's atmosphere, but there's still a little bit that gets through and hits the rocks and makes these radioactive particles. Now, when you say radioactive and nuclear, I mean, the thing that comes to mind is like uh, a nuclear power plant or something like that. Is it anything like that? These are really, really super small concentrations. So if you've got a gram of rock exposed at the surface, you might produce five atoms of beryllium-10, one of the nuclides I work with, in a whole year. So they're barely there. We have to have very specialized equipment just to even measure them. We're basically counting them atom by atom as they run through the instrument. So when, you, when you're in the field, do you have, are you able to take the equipment that detects them with you? Or? Oh no, we bring, we bring the samples back to the lab. So, we'll, so, so if we go back to caves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I figured out as part of my PhD that, that we can use these rocks that have been hit by cosmic rays to date caves because the rocks that come from the surface have been hit by cosmic rays. They're brought into a cave where they're shielded and then we can use radioactive decay to date how long it is. So I never got into caves until I was in graduate school. Why it did came, you then? It came from the dating side. Okay. Uh, and I loved it from the very beginning. <laughs> now, so, I, I have seen you squeeze in places that I don't think my big fat head would fit <laughs> in rocks. It, it's, I, I'm so not I, claustrophobic, but I think yeah. in your world I would be. I can fit my body through a hole that's the size of a legal sheet of paper. What? About eight and a half inches <laughs> thick and maybe 14 inches wide. Did you have to do training before you did this? Or you just, <laughs> no. oh, I can fit you through here. Just do it. You just do it. Just oh, do okay. It. Yeah. You didn't go for like the caving side to grad school. Why were you in grad school? What were you, it was just the, 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 the dating, the radioactive nuclei so, that you were interested in? Um, I came into graduate school and I, I became interested in landscape evolution. How did landscapes change over time? No, wait, landscape. Landscapes like, like hills and valleys okay. and rivers and caves, okay. Okay. Um, the land surface. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in quantifying that, and I came in at just the right time. I had a physics degree uh, from my bachelor's, um, and there was a new method that 
where we were able to measure these cosmogenic nuclides in rocks for the first time. So I was one of the first generation of geologists to really start using that method and figure out ways to measure erosion rates and date cave sediments and things like that. Now, I, I've heard of carbon-14, C-14 mm -hmm. dating. Is that, that totally is, different? Nope. It's actually, carbon-14 is produced by cosmic rays in the atmosphere. It is a cosmogenic nuclide. So these cosmic rays, they pass through the atmosphere, they cause nuclear reactions, they change nitrogen into carbon, and then that carbon goes through the atmosphere, it gets absorbed by plants and eaten by animals, and then that decays over time, and you can use that for radiocarbon dating. So the same cosmic rays hit the rocks, and they produce nuclides inside the rocks instead of inside the atmosphere. So the carbon-14 travels all around the world, the beryllium-10, aluminum-26, they stay inside that rock. So we're able to collect those rocks out in the field. Okay. We bring them back, we crush them, we dissolve them in acid completely, and then spend a few weeks of chemistry, and we get that down to um, just the pure beryllium or pure aluminum. It's less than a milligram, which is, is sort of the size of a the head of a pin. We stick that in what's called an accelerator mass spectrometer. We have one here at Purdue, which is um, a big particle accelerator. It, we take those, um, those samples and we, we ionize them. We, we turn them into individual atoms or individual molecules, send them through a particle accelerator, so they're going about 10% the speed of light. And then we whip them around some magnets and send them through electric fields. And so the only ones that get through are the ones we're interested in measuring. So we can count atom by atom, the beryllium-10 or the aluminum-26 that we know were produced by these cosmic rays maybe a million years ago. We can, we can use them to date how long that's been buried. Do we need to worry about these cosmic rays as we're walking outside? Well, generally no. People do worry about cosmic rays for airline pilots, for example, mm -hmm. that are way up in the atmosphere you have a lot less shielding um, you have to worry about it if you're an astronaut um, the astronauts actually this is really cool they uh, studied for a while they get flashes of light in their eyes and what that is is a cosmic ray passing through their eyeball and making a flash in their retina so no they, they actually what? studied that <laughs> it's crazy wow and they could map out as the astronauts went around the globe how many of these flashes they saw per hour. And they, and, they physically and see those flashes yeah, of light. they see a flash of light. Whoa. It's a cosmic ray passing through their eyeball. And they can map out basically the magnetic field of the Earth from, on... from how many flashes they see. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, no, that's But wild. Down, here, <laughs> down here at the ground surface, we're protected by um, the atmosphere, so we don't, have, we don't have to worry about the radiation. Okay. Not now... You, you said it's produced in the rock. What do you mean by produced in the rock? You said nuclides. Yeah, so a rock, in rock. So we'll talk about quartz. It, quartz is a mineral inside a rock, and um, it's a really hard, very resistant to weathering mineral, um, one we use a lot. It's made of the elements silicon and oxygen. Right? Silicon is uh, it's got a mass of 28, and oxygen has a mass of 16. Right. So if a, a big cosmic ray or a fast cosmic ray comes in and hits that um, quartz and passes through the quartz, it may crash into a silicon nucleus or hit a beryllium, okay. or sorry, hit an oxygen. Mm -hmm. And then it's got so much energy that when it knocks it, it will knock a piece off. So that silicon that has a mass of 28 a piece of it gets broken off, some neutrons and protons, and that can make aluminum with a mass 26. You knock a proton off, now it's a different element. You knock neutrons off, now it's a different mass. So when you say it knocks a piece off, you're speaking in terms of atoms. It knocks part, part of the, the subatomic the particles. The subatomic particles, okay. the protons mm -hmm. and neutrons. Okay. So it takes an atom of silicon and converts it to an atom of aluminum wow. that's lighter. Now it there was one year, a few years ago, you were carrying around, I want to say it was an artifact 
from like Africa or something. So I, I've done a lot of work in archaeology and in human evolution. Um, that started with the caves, actually, because there are a lot of fossils and artifacts in caves. They're very well deposited, very well preserved. And so I started going to cave sites that have human fossils in them and date the sediment around those fossils. So we've dated um, Sturkfontein in South Africa, for example. There's an Australopithecus fossil there, a beautiful fossil. There um, a whole set of fossils in that cave. Mm -hmm. I've worked a lot in China also recently in human evolution sites and archaeology sites. Uh, we're able to um, date uh, these stone tools and we found some of the oldest evidence for early humans in Asia uh, oh, recently. Wow. So. And that's based on dating the sediment that's around those That's based on dating family? either the sediment around so if it's, a, if it's a fossil, and that fossil is in gravel, then we'll date the gravel around that fossil and see when it was brought into a cave. Um, if it's a, a stone artifact, sometimes we date the artifact itself. Okay. And so we'll, we'll dissolve it. We, we only dissolve them if they're a lot, and we can really afford to completely destroy one. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Most of the time, we're dating the sediment around the artifacts and the fossils, but that's been a really fun aspect of my work. I've gotten to see some amazing fossil sites around the world. What's the coolest thing you've ever done? Oh, I know, that's on the spot. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably the one. coolest thing I've ever seen is at Sturkfontein, the, the Littlefoot skeleton. It's this Australopithecus skeleton. They found it. Inside a cave, it's a near, it's about 90% complete. And I was there when they were excavating it. So you're looking at this breccia, these broken rocks all cemented together inside the cave. And you can see this skull and hand and shoulder blade and everything of a, of a skeleton, almost like it's looking out at you. And it's, it's 3.7 million years old. It's a completely oh, different goodness. species, one of our early human ancestors. Whoa. <laughs> All right. I don't know if I'd be <laughs> creeped cool. out or <laughs> maybe a little bit of both and excited. That is cool. You had mentioned that you had a physics degree for your mm -hmm. undergraduate and then you, I know you've talked about some pretty chemistry concepts and then you work here in the Department of Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. Right. So what advice do you have for high school students that sort of like science but aren't sure maybe what they want to do with it, because I would say, I think it's fascinating the career you have and the things you've done with a physics degree from, from a four-year Right, so, I mean, as scientists, I think we're flexible. You can, you learn science, you learn the scientific method, you learn something, some basic skill. For me, it was physics. Um, and then, once you have that, you can apply it to all kinds of different problems. Um, I never realized when I was an undergraduate or a high school student that I could apply what I was learning to earth sciences. I didn't really realize a lot of that until graduate school when I went into earth sciences and realized when I went in, um, in my incoming group of graduate students, mm -hmm. most of us had degrees from outside earth sciences. Really? There were degrees in computer science, chemistry, physics, biology, but we're all applying these different sciences to other problems. So there's a lot of cross dis op a lot of opportunities for cross disciplinary research in science. Nice. That so makes sense. learn the basics. Mm -hmm. You know, we all speak the language of math. We've all got to learn physics. We've all got to learn some chemistry and biology. But then you can apply it to whatever problems you find interesting. What about a student that thinks, well, I don't think I can do physics. Did you ever have to overcome any challenges, or did you ever have anything that you would consider maybe a, I feel like I sort of failed at that, but then I came through that? Because I think a lot of students I've had, they, they experience a failure, and then they sort of shut off. And, yeah, and then... it, it's hard. I mean, my first semester in college, I got a D in no quantum. <laughs> and it was a class I shouldn't have been taking anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> but what did you... I had to 
back up and take it again and okay and do better and interesting yeah so you don't have to succeed on the first try huh? no <laughs> and still be successful no but find you know find something you're interested in and for me a lot of it's about working with other people mm -hmm. um, find somebody to study with find somebody to explain the problem to oh you know, that's a good point that's the right. best way to learn is to explain you realize what you don't know when you're explaining to someone else. That's excellent advice. Find someone to study with. Mm -hmm. Well, I like that. I do too. And with explaining too, and the, all the different people you collaborate with, I mean, around the world, you have people all over the world you collaborate oh, with. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like the fact that where you say explain to someone, because I know I've been to some of the uh, science conferences, GSA, AGU, and stuff. And uh, you guys do sessions, poster sessions, or, or regular talks. Well, you're always explaining what you're researching to other people. Right. It, why do scientists, why are they always doing that? Well, so part of it is networking and figuring out what other people are doing. We're always looking for collaborations to figure out what somebody else is doing. So maybe you can work together with them or you can learn their method and apply it to your problem. Um, that's a lot of what we do. And it's, uh, you know, explaining how you're attacking this particular problem. And, and hopefully other people will, will want to talk to you and, and use your method. Have you ever got to the point where you started to present and people asked you questions that made you then question yourself? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the, the whole process is... Um, is, is getting these questions and one of the very important skills that you have to have as a scientist is to recognize when you're wrong and there is no shame in admitting that you're wrong. Um, what we do as scientists is try to come up with an idea and then shoot it down as many ways as you can. Wait, that's what you're trying to do? Yeah, is it? That's the scientific method is, okay. is, is try to figure out can this be wrong? Is there some way that this is wrong? And so we're always, usually in a friendly way, trying mm -hmm. to shoot down each other's <laughs> ideas. Usually. Like usually. That. <laughs> <laughs> but you always try to shoot down your own ideas, too, um, and listen to other people's uh, ideas, to other people who are suggesting maybe this isn't right. Um, when we write papers, we have peer review, and the reviewers are always criticizing the work and they're trying to poke holes in it as many ways as they can and, and you come out stronger. If there's a problem, then you just admit it and move on and figure out why it was wrong and and you've made progress. I like that. Me too. Um, yeah. So. There is, yeah, there's no shame in, in science if, if you're wrong. You just admit it and move on. I like that. So. I know that's one of the things in the classrooms, we're always explaining explain your work yes justify yeah. why do you yes. think this and so uh sometimes you think it's just in the classroom you don't realize it's actually getting you ready to be in the real world and being able to do that so where do you see what's the future of your thing your cosmogenic nuclei your, <laughs> your dating things in 20 years from now we come back and we're like hey what's happening what do you think the new thing will be in 20 years in your field that is a hard question to answer. In, the, in terms of the, the dating and the cosmogenic nucleus, I think we're going to see changes in how well and how easily we can measure these things. Right now, we've got a big old 10 million volt machine across the campus. It's got an accelerator as big as a railroad car. The whole machine's as big as a warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are going to be advances, and people are going to figure out different ways to measure these nuclei and, and ways to measure them better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that'll let us look at problems, uh, look at different sets of problems uh, more precisely. I think eventually you'll be able to take equipment to be small enough, technology to be high enough that you'll be able to take that out to the field and be able to do like almost instant dating on yeah, things? Yeah, I, I, perhaps. <laughs> they, <laughs> they've um, I've actually done this uh, for or they're working on this for interplanetary missions oh. as well, putting in mass spectrometers and 
sure. looking at carcinogenic nuclides on other planets. Hmm. So when they when they want to do like a, a the next Mars expedition, they're send mm -hmm. the next rover yeah. over to Mars. Will they talk to people like you and, and to get background information on what they should be looking for in places like that? People like me, uh, geomorphologists and um, people who specialize in cosmogenic nuclei definitely have a role in uh, this kind of research. I'm not personally involved, but yeah, absolutely. In fact, the, the beginnings of cosmogenic nuclides really were in studying the lunar sample mm -hmm. brought back from the moon, where the concentrations on the moon are so much higher than they are on Earth. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere. It doesn't have much erosion. Uh, and so the samples were far easier to measure. And those were measured many years ago. We're only, only in my PhD where we advanced to the point where we were able to make them, make these measurements on Earth. Now, has technology changed where you had to go back and date something again? And you're like, oh, no, it was, we didn't hit it right the first time? That happens all the time. Okay. Um, most of the time, it's not that we didn't hit it right, but uh, it's that now we can measure it so much better than we did before. More precisely. Yeah, more precisely. Okay. So maybe it was, before we would say it was 10 plus or minus 5, and now we'll come back and we'll see, okay, well, it's really 8 plus or minus 1. Oh, uh, okay. okay. Right. Just kind of narrowing in on the... We're narrowing in mm -hmm. on, the, on the values. So I've actually saved all my samples from wow. pretty much my whole career, and I'll bring them up every now and then and remeasure them. Oh, wow. It must be organized. <laughs> no, there's a room full of okay. stuff. It's not very organized. I don't know if it's like a side room of the house. <laughs> All that stuff. No. Special set, set of shelves. All right, so what do you do for a hobby then? This is what you do. I mean, you study, you like caves, you like the, the science behind the, you can fit the dating through a chemistry. piece of paper. <laughs> you can fit through paper. <laughs> right. If next week you're like, oh, I, I don't have any deadlines next week, I can take vacation, what would you do? I like to be outside. Um, I like to go hiking and camping and canoeing and biking and running and all of these things. I would actually like to, I'd like to head out to the mountains. We live here in Indiana, mm -hmm. about as far as from a mountain as you can get. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> it's always nice to have an opportunity to go out to the mountains. Now, is it possible for you to do recreational things without looking at what's around you through the science lens? I think it's, I don't know, it's, I look at things differently now. Before I was a geologist, I, you know, I was out hiking all the time as well, um, but I didn't really, it was just a rock, right? All rocks were just rocks. And now I go back to those same places and I see them completely differently. I see the, a bigger story hmm. when I'm hiking. And I've actually always am thinking about an angle about, can I come back here and get funded to work here? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Do you have any instances that stick out in your mind where you were going in to do research and you really thought you were going to have one outcome and then it turned out to be something totally different than how you thought it might? Actually, nothing's, nothing's Nothing. coming to mind right now. Okay. I, I do have, I mean, there are a lot of cases where I've gone in and just not had an open mind. So okay, sure. I don't know what this is going to be, how old this is going to be. Mm -hmm. Actually, here's, here's, there is one example, and it's um, some really neat work we've done in northern China where we have found now an artifact bearing layer with very crude stone tools and it is super old. Okay. Um, it's uh, almost two and a half million years old. Way, way older than anyone expects, including me. We started working there about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I got the first results and said, these aren't right. I will not publish these. There is no way that early humans were in China two and a half million years ago. So we went back and we sampled again and we got a similar number. I said, well, I still don't believe it. <laughs> <Yes>. So <laughs> it's too old. And so we went back and did it better. And we collected a bunch of samples um, in a way that would absolutely prove the age uh, is, is right or wrong. Uh, we went out and drilled these holes, a ton of work, mm -hmm. and the ages all came back exactly the same. Oh. And so this is a really a shocking, surprising result. I had no expectation that we were going to stumble upon this you know, right. oldest human site. It was discovered in the 1960s. It's just never really been dated before. And so that, that I think, has been a real surprise. Wow. that is neat. Well, thank you. 
We appreciate you taking time. Okay. I know you're Glad extremely busy schedule, <laughs> yes. but uh, we appreciate this. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you love superheroes of science, be sure to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Be sure to join us as we add interviews of scientists and incorporate discussions of current trends in K-12 science. Until next time, be super and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down.